What's happening, world? I'm your host, the Wizard of Waz, Benji Wozniak, and this week we're going to do the new Hellraiser. Gods to some, demons to others. Okay, so Hellraiser, obviously the new one that just got released on Hulu. Let's dive in. Okay, let's talk about your history with maybe Clyde. There's so much here. Okay, you guys, I'm so excited. That's why I can't form a cohesive sentence. So let's start with your history with Hellraiser, the original first. Okay, so my thing with Clive Bach is I originally started reading his books, The Books of Blood. Oh my God, so good, okay. All right, so that's how I got into Clive Bach. And one of the stories in that is basically the aforementioned Hellraiser, which they make into the movie. And when the movie came out, I had to go see it because huge Clive Bach fan. I was like, I got to go see this. So I went and saw it and it blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, like just because of like, how gory and graphic it was insane and the original it, insane it, it was just awesome and then when they introduced pinhead and it's to see him for the first time it was just like you know they built it up and built it up and then all of a sudden here he is and he had the long black coat the pins in his face and it was just amazing because i was like you know you read the book and you picture what he looks like and then you see it on thing and i was like oh my god but i will say i like the new pinhead better okay so where are, are we gonna start talking about this right now so i'll dive in i have so many things the new pinhead lady pinhead i love one thing I thought was an incredible choice that the sound, the sounding and the directing did was that they overlaid female vocals and male vocals for every line that they wrote. So that's why the, and then mix them together. Yeah. And that's why their voice is so haunting and cool. Sorry, Clyde Barker, you guys didn't do that in the 80s. Love you to pieces. But that like lo- that detail I thought was so good. Yeah. And like for me, the reason I like. All right. So I like the original movie. I love the original movie. But I thought that the creatures would be more angelic looking and that's what they were in this movie i thought i thought they looked more borderline demon angelic than they did in the other okay so we can debate this because i have i'm excited that you brought this up so early agree these are much more not not to use the word heavenly but they are much more other dimensional yes these creatures whereas in the original they're very i'm gonna use the word wet yeah they're very wet and visceral which i am a huge fan of because these are sadomasochist gods essentially Mm -hmm. and if i'm doing blood sacrifices to get to you you gotta be you gotta be dripping in it you know what i mean and i think i agree with you the production of these monsters are beautiful the I always forget their names, but the one that has the throat like open. Yes. I love her. The rope one. Mm -hmm. Love her. I love them. I love. And they are more angelic and they are beautiful. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I love the wetness of the originals. I just think, so for me, it's just the fact that like, so for the Hellraisers, like when they come out, I feel that these are not angels or demons, but like, like in the middle. Yeah, they're, they're like, gods. Yeah, they're like like demi god, you know, because because they say you have to like I want to see your god, you know? yeah, and he says that I want to see your god, and then they basically turn him into the god at the end. So I have I don't think they turned him into the god at the end. I think that I forget his name. I think he grossly misunderstood yeah what he was doing. So oh, oh hell yeah, <laughs> because because I think he looks at Pinhead and is like Pinhead is your priest, right? Yeah. I have your priest, this is my church, and I have your priest hostage. And I think, okay, so I don't know how I want to say this with, because I want to sound coherent. I don't think, in the sense of what God is, right? Okay, so if we look (laughs) in your face, you're like, what is happening? (laughs) So in the sense of like, if we go, we're going to remove Hellraiser, we're going to move, we're going to talk biblically right now. If we biblically look at like God and what angels were, they are these abstract beings. So to me, when we see this like ship almost come down as like a portal door, whatever, they, they take him up into it. I was like, okay, I can understand this being like God because God is everywhere and nowhere. If you believe, okay, if you believe in God and you believe in the Bible or whatever religious text, God is this omniscient being, right? And so he's everywhere. I don't think there's like an embodiment of him. Right. And I think that's what we were seeing at the end when we see, I forget his name. It's like Jonathan, I don't know. I don't know. The guy who turns into a Cenobite at the end. I think, and we see him getting ripped apart. I am imagining this invisible force that is the main god of 
the Cenobites. Yeah. But I feel like the Cenobites are what we could, I mean, they're called angels, but I believe that they're what, like, the angels would be because, does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. See, like, for me, angels are servants of God. So these, and these are servants, servants of, of this, this God. Of what yeah. we would call, like, the Leviathan, which right. is, like, the final um, thing. I mean, I don't think we're ever supposed to see their what they would consider their leader. Right. Because they all look to Pinhead. Right. I hope I made sense, you guys. It makes more sense in my head. I just guess I... I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. This is why we're co-hosts. Right, right, right. Um, I'm not just saying that because she's here. Because <laughs> I really mean it. <laughs> so I loved the ending of this one because I loved actually seeing this transformation because it is so true. Like He's like, I've had everything I needed I and I want pleasure he thought he wanted life but he wanted pleasure no he got pleasure and he thought he wanted not so he got power instead sorry i got them confused you guys and i thought it was so funny that he is so dumb right he's sacri blood if you have to blood sacrifice someone do you really think you're gonna get exactly what you want the way you wanted right they gave him pleasure an insane pleasure right. it wasn't sexual And they even say, they say, be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. And, okay, and I love, I I have so many thoughts about this movie. I'm so excited. And what I love is that they really left it up to the hands of these people. They were like, okay, you summoned us. What do you want? I loved the relationship between Penhead and our protagonist. I thought that it was incredible because she, as a protagonist, love the first movie, has so much more agency than our protagonist from the first. I think her name's Nancy. Guys, I'm really bad at names. I forget all their names. But for the first one, she doesn't really have any agency. She doesn't really know how to stop her stepmom and her estranged uncle from, or her mom, I guess it is her biological mom. She doesn't know how to stop her biological mom and her uncle from killing all these people. She just sees it happen. And then she happens upon the puzzle box in the original. In this one, this girl has an act, is actively using it. And we can talk about the twist later, which, did you think it was a twist? Yeah. Really? Okay. We'll get back into that. So let's finish up our history with the first one before we can dive into the second one. I just didn't think that the guy was a bad guy until the end. I, that kind of caught me by surprise. I was like, oh, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. Can I say one thing? Yes. Which is, I knew he was a bad guy the moment he started drinking in front of an addict. This, I don't know if it's like lazy writing or just like what they were trying to do. So in this storyline, one of the main things and one of the reasons why people don't believe her is that this protagonist is a drug addict. She is in a recovery for pill addiction. Her brother, her brother's boyfriend and their roommate, like lady friend, all say, we don't drink in front of her. We don't do this in front of her. We try to help her. She says she met her boyfriend in a program. And then we have him drinking in front of her we have him offering her alcohol we have him like doing all these i see it bad things in front of her that i'm like okay yeah he's got a nice butt but that's literally it yeah but my whole thing with that was like the reason they had the box is because both of them broke into that warehouse but he so she knew he was a bad guy so i figured she didn't care no but there's a difference i okay so i think there's a difference between being a bad guy robber and being a bad guy drug addict and what he was is he was the worst of both because what he did was he preyed on a drug addict yeah got yeah. them to a point where he could control them make them feel safe and then take out his bidding which i think is awful and this is why i think he was a bad guy and so when this whole thing was revealed i was like i was like kill him i was like sacrifice him instead of your brother they're both here yeah. sacrifice him right so i don't know maybe that's just like i don't know i that to me was not a shock when he turned out bad but I do like his killing scene because it gives her another great moment of agency right. where she tells the Senbite, she's like, I have the box. I decide. I never picked him. I pick him. Yeah. And she saves her boyfriend, her brother's boyfriend and sacrifices her boyfriend, which I think was just like another great moment of agency because we have this character who no one believes, right. who everyone call- calls a drug addict. They walk on eggshells. They don't respect. It doesn't feel like they respect her. Uh, they're like, they want to help her, but they don't know how. She's given this ultimate power. Right. I like, she, I like the fact she wasn't fooled. She wasn't fooled. You know, because the Cenobite's like, all right, we'll, we'll bring your brother back. And she's like, she, you can see in her face, she's she's pondering, and then she's looking at him, and she's like, no. It's not him. She's like, no. <laughs> it's not him. Yeah. And I think it shows how smart she is. And yeah. I think it shows how thoughtful she is whereas when we look at the first one it's a whole different beast 
our protagonist isn't even the puzzle master. No. no. Whereas in this one, our protagonist is. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought that was a great leap. And I know people are like, well, it's not as good as the original. Yeah, but it's a different, it's a fully different story from the original. Yeah. It's 100% different. But they kept the basic principles of the movie, like the box and the, uh, the Cinebites. And they kept like, you know, if you, if you start the box, you got to finish the box. Absolutely. Yeah. And, but that comes from, I feel like the Hellraiser is similar to Predator where you can put Predator into any situation right. and it would be fun. Right. You can put this box into any situation oh, yeah? and mess with people and it will be fun. Yeah. It's not, it's not this like linear idea of like, that's why I like this movie a lot because it, it's the box in a modern setting. <laughs> be great if you threw it in the Scooby-Doo. Oh, my be God. Like, How yeah. funny would that be? That'd be we awesome. got Scrappy-Doo. Right. Scooby's going to sacrifice him. Right. Stab right. him right there. Right. You have to choose. Okay. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, I think it would be hilarious. That would be hysterical. Oh, my <laughs> God. Imagine the Cenobites being like, is this a talking dog? Right. <laughs> what do we do? Uh, back on track. <laughs> back on track. But I would, but like, I would watch, I would watch this puzzle box in any scenario. Yeah. I think it would be really interesting. And I think it's really interesting because, okay, so Clive Barker, master of horror, yes. incredibly talented, builds incredibly rich worlds. Yes. He has, he's done so much. And I think, I mean, he was an executive producer on this. So like everyone can like poo poo this show. He was right there. He was right there in the movie making it. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's a testament to his writing that they even made these into movies. Oh my like, God. He's an incredible writer. Yeah. So, like, you know, you look at some of the people that have made movies out of their books, like like Stephen King, Dean Coons. So, you know, Clive Barker, like, a lot of people didn't know who Clive Barker was. Right. And then he came out with these books of blood, and, like, the horror community lost their minds because it was just the concept of, you know, the whole thing, you know, they're writing their stories on your body is just amazing. And, like, he's, he's such a good horror writer. I, I like him a lot. I like him a lot. And I think what he does is he blends, he so effortlessly blends this like what terrifies us and what really drives us and scares us. And he mashes that with this kind of like fantastical like creatures and like mysticism. And I think it's really powerful and hot take right here. I find Clive Barker more interesting and successful, not successful, but more interesting than Stephen King because I don't think Stephen King can end a book. Yeah. And I feel like Clive Barker is a full storyteller. Yeah. My thing with Stephen King is I think after his early works, he he lost track on how to end a story. That like, makes sense. Like I liked Carrie. I liked Pet Cemetery, I liked Cujo. And then you go after like go past those and all of a sudden these books like they're long, they're drawn out, they're boring at some point, and then you know, you flip the flop whether you want to read it anymore. Like, Absolutely. Like I've had some Stephen King books in my hand and I'm like do I want to finish this? I, I'm not even sure because I just didn't like it. And I'm like, I got to put this down. Like, I loved Regulators. If you read Regulators, that's great. But then the other part to Regulators, I didn't like it. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, it's this, bad. I was like, this sucks. And I was like, I don't want to read this. I'm like, I, I put it down. And then Cell, I just read Cell recently. And the concept is great. I loved it. But there was parts of the book where I'm like, okay, yep, I'm going to put this down now because it's just not catching my attention. Yeah. And, Clive Barker always catches my attention because consistently he, he's he's his stories are enthralling uh, that you get into them and you're like oh my god what's going to happen to this what's going on what happens to this person you know oh and it makes you want to continue reading oh absolutely and I think he creates monsters and human characters that are dynamic yes because honestly the Cenobites are not the villains of this story no they are just chilling doing what they do torturing people yep and then they are like okay y'all summoned us like right. the, i love like how they're kind of like how penhead at one point is kind of just like okay well like the box is in your hands like you right. gotta do like you gotta choose right. you can't not choose i think it's basically the villain in this whole thing is human arrogance human arrogance mostly from the main that one guy what's yep. it i want to call him jonathan i yep. don't think that's his name i think it's if you watch all the hell races it's Whoever first goes after the box, it's their arrogance. Yeah. That starts the whole downfall of everybody else. Then you have to have someone come in and basically right the ship, you know, like fix the Cenobites to go back to where they came from. Because, you know, it's like, it's like Pandora's box. You know, it's basically this box is Pandora's box. You, you open Pandora's box, you know, and they, they're coming for you. It is. But 
they're only coming for you because you're summoning them. I think you're right. It is human arrogance. And it is what we see in these films, male arrogance. Yes. In the first one, you see it with her uncle who's escaped prison and like killing people to get his form back because he's also, so he's escaped the cell. I didn't mean prison. He escaped the cell that he was in within their dimension. The Cenobites, yeah. The Cenobites. And then he's like sucking his form back and like, to like the, when you know when like the woman um her mom is like bring it like seducing men and bringing them in and like killing them killing them just so he can like then kill them i think first of all wait there's a lady gaga quote that i want to say and i want to just get it right so give me a second i don't believe in the glorification of murder but i do believe in the empowerment of women and that is how i feel about these movies i feel like it f- fits it perfectly because it's very much like In the first one, you see her mom luring these men to help her lover, right? Right. Not knowing, just being driven by lust. And then in this one, you see this man trying to reach the epitome because he has everything. And then we see this girl being like, I want nothing. It's just, it's so interesting to see. If you think about it, both scenarios deal with male lust. Lust for power, lust for sex, lust for, you know, empowerment. Absolutely. And it's awful. But it's also very it's interesting because humans are so arrogant in the sense that we have these like very black and white ideas of what pain and pleasure is right Mm -hmm. and i mean we we see it when pinhead is talking to the girl that gets her back ripped off again you guys i'm so sorry i don't remember names but she's like he they're like you're gonna feel everything even if you don't expect it you're feeling everything and She's like, I just want this to stop. And then they rip her back out. Incredible scene. Yeah. Another criticism I have of this movie, and then I'm going to get back to my point, is this movie is shot so dark. It is a bl- black, pitch black. Right. The, no contrast. I don't think people know how to light films anymore. This is a separate conversation. But back to the point of the pain and pleasure, we see that arrogance in the man again when he's like, well, when I picked pleasure, I thought it would be sexual. And they're like, this could be sexual. Right. He's like, no, I'm in pain. Right. Well, there's, I forget what it's called. There's like a part of like human desire where like hurting themselves is pleasurable. Like they put cigarettes on themselves, they cut themselves, and it's erotic. I am not into that, but there, I forget what it's called, but there's actually, they put cigarettes on themselves, they cut themselves, they like put pins in themselves, and it's an erotic feeling for them. And like, I guess pain is pleasure pain is pleasure and we are not here on the was happening podcast to shame anyone for Judge, their shame. Look, look, we're what, not trying to do that whatever you do you do <laughs> um it's exciting and yeah. i think this movie plays into that yeah. and i think it gets twi- i mean obviously this is an extreme these are sadomasochist gods who their goal is to torture and kill they are not getting pleasure out of it. But what they're saying is that as humans, we have such a small scope of what we view as pleasure. Right, right. And, you know, that's the main thing. Like, we are narrow-minded. We are narrow-minded. And I love at the end when the man, I'm going to call him Jonathan. I don't know what his real name is. Guys, I'm so sorry. When Jonathan transforms into the Cenobite at the end because he chose power, yeah. I think because to them, this is the ultimate power, living forever and enacting whatever torture you want. Right. That's power to them. Right. And I don't think that's what he was thinking when he said power. No. He, like, he meant like earthly power. Right. And even Pinhead says, are you sure? This yeah. This is what you want. And he's like, yes. And he's like, okay. He's like, and you can see the look on his face like, like you kind of screwed up, buddy. <laughs> yeah. He's like, okay, let's go. And it's so interesting because Pinhead again and again. Or any, I mean, Pinhead's the only main one that talks, but any of the Cenobites, again and again, they just laugh at humans because they're like, oh, yeah, you only think of these earthly things. You only think of right now. You only think of of this earth. And they're like, we're gods. We're from another dimension. Time does not exist. Pain and pleasure are the same thing. And you have to expand your mind. And I think that's why the girl was so smart. Yeah. Yeah. I like when the guy says, I have you trapped. And Pinhead looks at him and goes, do you? Do you? Yeah. Do you, do you, are you that narrow-minded to think that we don't know what's going on? You know, yeah. We're omnipotent. We know everything. We cause everything. You know, and then you think that this trap that we've, we've been around, we've studied, we've looked at, 
is going to keep us. Yeah. They're like, okay, so you've built this one box. And I think, too, that they were, like, obviously playing with them, like, at the end. Like, I did love when they're trapped and they're all the Cenobites are in the courtyard and they're just, like, slowly, like, coming in. I thought that was so cool and spooky. I thought the movie did a lot of really great jobs and employed a lot of tactics that I really like that we see in films a lot. Like, I don't know. It was a little bit predictable to me, but in a way that was really fun. Yeah, no, you could see where this was going, but it was enjoying watching. Like, I enjoyed every bit of it. I was like, all right, I, I see what's going to happen here, and I can't wait for it to happen. I, I can't wait for it to happen. Yeah. And I mean, here's the thing. Clive Barker is a horny writer. Like, and I love horniness in horror movies. Not to, now I want to be explicitly clear <laughs> when I talk about this. I love sex and horniness in horror movies. I am vehemently opposed to sexual violence in film. I do not like it. Those two things are completely different. You can be horny in a horror film without being sexually violent or or exploitative. Yes, I get it. You get it. I get it. I love the opening of this movie when we have the one guy getting sacrificed in the Leviathan configuration to then our protagonist having sex. That is the horniness I like to see. That is the horniness in movies I'm talking about. I thought it was very fun. Contrasting. It was contrasting, but it also sets the tone for this movie because we have them were introduced to these sadomasochist villains, like, or not villains, but gods. And I think it's so interesting and super fun. And I love it. I think the first Hellraiser was very horny in an 80s way. Yep. And I think this one is a little less horny, but still kind of horny. Yeah. The box and the requests that people make for the box are basically sexual pleasures. Like, sexual. like the first guy, he wants to feel, he wants to feel the utmost sex, the utmost sexual pleasure. He says, and then they give him what he wants, and he doesn't like what he gets. He doesn't like what he gets. Yeah. He gets like this, like if you guys haven't seen it, as you know, spoiler show. He has like this, like clock sort of like mechanism, like very steampunky. And I was like, okay, yep. like mechanism that just like hits all his nerves at different times, and he can never calculate what it's going to be next. And I think that's cool. Yeah. I don't know. It winds his tendons. Yeah. And he's like, you know, in ag- out of agony, but it's also like like a sexual agony. Like That's, that's what they were doing. Yeah. That's why they gave it to him. Yeah, if that makes any sense. It's like a sexual agony. Like, he's yeah. in utmost pain, but it's also a pleasurable pain, from, at least in the Cenobites, like, thoughts. Mine, like, this yeah. is pleasure, you know, and he doesn't think so. He absolutely does not think no. so. But... We have him then transforming at the end, which is exciting. And we have the girl and her brother's boyfriend just trying to like sit with what happened, which I think would be super interesting to see. So what I liked about this movie is we have a protagonist who is in recovery, right? Yep. Very interesting already. And I feel like maybe it was lazy writing that we didn't dive into more of her history. We just sort of got glimpses of it through how people treated her and like her decision making, which I felt like was like very accurate but i think that she sort of brought this like levity to the movie where she brought this sort of forward thinking where she was like people don't kind of like costello so in our last episode we just talked about Eben costello where no one believed her yeah and in costello no one believed him because he was dumb but in this one no one believes her because she's an addict right it's stereotyping it's stereotyping and i think that's so true even today if you hear a story and someone's like oh and someone would add in the caveat that the person either relaying the story or involved in the story has any sort of like drug issues, I think is a disservice because you're already in your mind discrediting what they're saying. And I think in this movie, they showed that everyone discredited what she was saying. And I thought that was very powerful. Yeah. For me, every time the person starts with the box, they're doing something bad they know is bad. And then their answer to correcting this is to do more bad, hoping that something good will come out of it. Absolutely. And... No. <laughs> no. I mean, for me, the only good I think came out of her yeah. was killing her awful boyfriend, yeah. getting rid of the character I'm referring to as Jonathan. Right. And I don't know. I think it really helped her development and her process of like learning to let go. And like, you know what? Sometimes people aren't there to clean up your mistakes. And sometimes the decisions and your actions are permanent. And I think that was more a resonating like takeaway for me. Yeah, I think in the end of both movies, the heroines get clarity. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, on themselves. On themselves. I would say a little less in the first one because she's more just like escaping this like awful family that she has. Right. Whereas this one, she has more agency in her life. She's like, we don't know what's going to happen to her, but she's not probably going to be a drug addict. She's probably going to take accountability and do these things that she was not doing throughout the whole movie. Yeah, I think in the first one, her clarity is she didn't see how bad her family really was. Okay, that makes sense. Like how downtrodden her dad was and yeah, how and awful how, her mom is. Right, I, I think, and you know, her uncle, I don't <sighs> think she was so naive to them that, right. that this brought her clarity about what she really was, or what her family really was about. Like right. her mother, her uncle, her father. Like, so she gets clarity on that. And this one, it's clarity on herself about like, you know, she has this addiction and only she can overcome it and only she could overcome the things that attacked her in this movie like her boyfriend being a two-faced prick like things like her brother's always taking care of her so like when she says good no i i know that's not my brother i think that was her clarity of i can't depend on him to help me no more right i have to do everything on my own so when she left there and the boyfriend says are you all right she's like yes and no you know i think no because of everything she went through but yes because I think she understands now what she has to face. Absolutely. And I think with certain situations, if someone's always cleaning up your mess, there's never any accountability right. and there's never any sort of responsibility. But she has to take responsibility for her brother's death. And I right. think she finally does that in that last moment. Right. I think so too. And I thought that was really, I thought it was good. I like the movie. I know a lot of people don't like the movie. I like the movie. I, I like the good. movie. I'm a huge advocate for it. Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, this. There's a few movies that people are like, oh, my God, I don't like it. And I'm like, I actually liked it. Like, the, the new Halloween ends. People hated the new Halloween ends. And I'm like, but I understood it. And I have not seen it, so I can't talk about it. But Well, we'll have to, you'll have to watch it. We'll see it. But I understood the ending. Like, you can't go into an ending and be like, all right, because everybody wants these, like, huge, climatic things. And sometimes in life, that's not how it happens. Absolutely. Things, things don't always end the way you want it to end. And for me, the way they ended it, it ended. I mean, oh, well, that's how it ended. You know? And for everybody else, this... They didn't want to see it end like that. Right. And you know what? Things end. Things you know? end. Here's the thing. Things end. Yep. Tom Brady. Patriots. That's what. Okay. Dynasty's over. It ended. Yeah. I, I'm going to say one thing and one thing only about Tom Brady. He should have. He should have just followed his beautiful wife, Giselle. And retired. And retired. And guess what? Human arrogance. Yep. And look at him now. He looks like shit. Yep. He's playing like shit. You open the box, Tom. You open the box, you Tom. open the box, Tom. <laughs> and he's failing. I mean, I don't give a shit about football, but God, Tom Brady. Yeah, all the Cinnabites are coming out to get you. Antonio Brown and all these other people will attack you. Good. And here's the thing. Giselle is beautiful and amazing and incredible. She makes more money. I don't know, like overall, but she made, she made more, more money, money than him. him. Yep. She All she wanted was him to show up for her family. She literally was just like, you're going to be a dad. Yep. And he can't give up football. You can't give up football. My God. Yep. Again. Human arrogance. Human arrogance. Tom Brady's like the Jonathan of this movie. <laughs> I don't, I know his name's not Jonathan, you guys. I do not yeah. remember it though. Well, I love Hellraiser. It's on Hulu. Please, please watch it. It is a fun ride. It is violent. It's a little dark, so watch it at night. <laughs> but I loved it. Uh, ben, anything that you got? No. I thought it was really great. Like, we've hit on all the points that I thought. I thought it was like one of those movies where you watch it and you see the character development and you actually see the Cinnabites develop it. So I, I liked it a lot. I think the Cinnabites are better in this one than the original for like the way they look and appear. They appear more like what I pictured them after I read the book. So that was my take. Absolutely. I wanted them to be a little wetter, but I love a horny, scary movie. And that's what we got. Yep. I highly recommend it for everybody. Thank you guys so much for listening. We love doing this. We're going to continue the spooky movies into October because spooky is our category. Right. So tune in next time to what's happening.